Yes. Uh, oh, soothsayer, oh, wise man of Abe Lincoln. Abe Lincoln yeah. was my second favorite ride at Disneyland. Jay Kogan was my first. Jeez. Wow. 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 Let's get into That's it. Crazy. How to be Abe Lincoln, based on the book by Jonathan Shapiro. And now here are your hosts, Jonathan Shapiro and Greg Grunberg. So when I was a kid, the greatest thing on earth was to go to Disneyland. Yeah. I was the kind of kid who my favorite part of Disneyland was great moments with Mr. Lincoln, which was a robot. Uh, Animatronic. Who, right. With the voice of the actor Royal Dano playing Lincoln and great moments of Mr. Lincoln. And for years, that was my favorite thing. We'd take the kids to Disneyland and they'd want to go on the Matterhorn or Pirates of the Caribbean. And I just made them sit there and watch great moments with Mr. Lincoln over and over and over again. Mm. But one year we went to California land. Have you been to- California Adventure? This is a one, th this is my part now. Okay. But yes, <laughs> California Adventure. Yeah. And we went to a ride called Flying Over California. Yeah, now, soaring a, over. You're getting everything wrong, but I understand. <laughs> I am a third generation Californian. So mm. this was, this was a, I was really looking forward to this ride. Yeah, I it's one of my favorite rides, by the way. By the way, is this the ride that, yeah. So when you go, there's, there's a, because of the, the legal profession, uh, there's a huge number of warnings and caveats before you're allowed on to the ride. And they have a video that they show mm, yeah. about how to behave when you're in the ride. Right. During that video, there's a man yes. who is immediately lovable and comic who is reprimanded yes. for not taking off the, uh, the mouse ears. The mouse ears. Yes. <laughs> and he gives a look that I have to tell you is the most heartbreaking. It's, it's Chaplet in City Lights. It's... <laughs> It's the kid with Wallace Berry. It breaks your heart. I couldn't go on the ride. Yeah. I was I was too upset. It's Jay Kogan. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's true. How did you get that gig? You know, a, a series of auditions. No, really come sweaty. On. No, the guy who filmed it, John Turtletop, was an old friend of mine since I was five, and he called me one day and said, "Will you come and do this for free?" And and not complain right. for the rest. You know, be the only person here not yelling at me. I said yes. So <laughs> you I know what's great? My uh, college girlfriend, who I haven't heard from for thirty uh, some odd years, uh, texted me after the first podcast saying it's too inside baseball Hollywood. So yeah. I'm glad we didn't do that. Oh right. no, no, yes. no, no. This is all about bringing on friends, people that we admire, people that that live their life. I don't know if it's Lincoln esque. We'll get into that. But for, for me, you do some things in your life that. I just find really admirable, and, and I love the uh, certain things. One thing called Philosophy Friday, your podcast, Podcaster. forgetting your you know royalty in Hollywood and all that. We'll get into all that, but Jake Hogan, thank you for uh, sitting down with us. Well, thank you for having me. I think your friend is saying it's a, you're so show busy all the yeah, time. Well, that, so there is that. So, uh, <laughs> so that. let's go back and talk about the kid whose favorite ride was Abe Lincoln. Like of all the roller coasters <laughs> that's a good and fun point. that you could point. have, that's yeah. a good point. What? What? How old were you when you realized you were no fun at all? Uh, I uh, I was blessed to know that almost immediately. Okay, good. Uh, anybody with an older brother knows that very sure. quickly. Uh, what I loved about that ride, and what I loved about Abe Lincoln, and what I love about Disneyland, is the narrative power of the dream right you go to disneyland and you're in these different lands and you have these different adventures that are really uniquely american and the, what we talk a lot about on this podcast is the unique the unique americanness of lincoln and my argument that he is the greatest american uh, who has ever been or in a way could ever be american president or american period okay you have to listen to all the things and if you want to take notes that's fine <laughs> it's a great question though because yeah. the I greatest american in any field, by any definition, wow. partly because of the time he lived in, yeah. which is the time where America became a great power, and because he was the central figure in the most important event in American history, an event which we th are told ended with the surrender of Lee to Grant and Appomattox Court, right. but in reality, an event that we're still living through. I agree with you completely. Are you aware of Polly Shore? 
Are just are you aware? I there remember. Are other Americans. Yes, that's true. Polly Shore is way up there. So on his podcast, yeah, which is talking about my podcast, Amway. I no. My podcast is called Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. <laughs> well, they, and, no, that's what the court order says. <laughs> yeah, I asked and, about the podcast. And right. the podcast takes pro, I take very interesting and, uh, and, and smart people in, that I know, and I pose questions to them that are on my mind. Instead of them coming, their expertise, I, I pose a question that I think they will help me get through. And then we talk about it. And that's helped you and your viewers. Uh, listeners, listeners. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It hasn't. It's a. Uh, it's 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 dropping soon. It's well, it's dropping. Not, it's not out yet. No, it's dropping in October. Somewhere. So yeah. when I said I've enjoyed it and I've listened to every episode, right. we knew you were lying. Yeah, but you're a lawyer, so that's fine. It's okay. like me saying I loved your book. Not. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's funny. That's the kind of funny thing you should say on the podcast. I should say that on the then, podcast, and that's that's everyone kind of would enjoy it. We will get notes right. about. Getting back to Lincoln, because yeah, my, my ex girlfriend said we got to focus a little more on Lincoln. Was that she said that when you were dating her, or yes. she said currently? Yes. And I thought in 1982, that's weird. Yeah, that is weird. I don't know what your podcast. Right. What like, is that? She's an you alien. Feel very animatronic. I want to talk about Lincoln. Lincoln is fascinating to me. I love Lincoln. Now, do you? Do you, you said our greatest president. Our greatest president. So you don't feel the greatest American? It's not prepared. I, I think that that no, it's okay. that uh, that he may be our greatest American, but he was. He was the leader of this country in a time of crisis, exactly what you said, and was smart enough, not just moral enough, but smart enough to figure out a way through. And that, you know, so he using, uh, you know, brains and and his own Humor. inner guide. And, you know, he's, he's a, a, a canny. Mm. He's not just, you know, standing on the principles of like, you know, abolition or anything. He's, he's waiting... He waits people out in the right way. He sort of talks around them to confuse them until, until they ultimately don't know what has been said. And then he'll figure out the right time to push forward in a political thing or in, in, in the case of the war thing and figure out where that goes. So few people have ever led this country that way. Uh, I'm fascinated with your answer because it shows a real deep knowledge of Lincoln. Are you a Lincoln yeah. student? What am I doing here if I didn't love Lincoln? Well, you're friends of ours. I thought this ours. was friendship, actually, yes. is what I thought this was. No. And have you been a lifelong student of Lincoln? Is this something that you've come to later in life? As I learned more about American history over time, well past when I was in school, as an adult, the Civil War became fascinating to me. Abe Lincoln became fascinating to me, just as George Washington is fascinating. There's many different leaders of our country who are fascinating to me for different reasons. Um, the George Washington story is a fabulous story too. But uh, the, the why don't you pitch your own podcast? No, okay, this is no, I have my own podcast. <laughs> this is all and about it's not about. <laughs> By the way, about, you say it. I have not heard it. <laughs> yeah, now you say that. But no, he. The Civil War, as you say, is the defining, the defining moment in American history, and is still reverberating right now in this current election, and will until we can get our heads out of our asses and figure out how to solve you know, this weird divide that shouldn't exist, but does. We had a, a wonderful uh, two guests from South Carolina, and I think we were both taken aback when mm -hmm. I asked him, what is the view of Lincoln, one of them's a professor, among your students in the South? So here is the thing. I asked that question, mm -hmm. and now he's taking credit for it. That's but great. it was really interesting because said, how do your students react when you bring up Lincoln? Right. What was fascinating was he said there's an immediate aggressive anti-Lincoln attitude. And these kids don't even know why. Right. They don't have a real answer, an educated answer. It's just they've been raised to be us against them. This is this is what th this new generation. So how do you think Lincoln would have dealt with what we're dealing with right now? Well, which gets us back to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And the re Nick, don't snort. There's a, there's a plan here and you undercut it no, with no, no. that. Nick's doing cocaine. <laughs> okay. Well. That was not a reaction to what you said. Get some law business out of this too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Walt Disney and Pablo Picasso, two great artists of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The great British historian Philip Johnson, in his book Intellectuals, compared the two of them and asked the question, which one will be remembered in a thousand years? And Johnson makes a strong argument that Walt Disney will be. 
long after Pablo Picasso, mm -hmm. uh, is a footnote. Right. And the reason is because Walt Disney managed to capture something that is both universal about humanity, particularly our interest in characters who represent human behavior that are not human, Mickey and Donald and the rest. But also he understood something about America. And his argument was, and he, Professor Johnson wrote a magisterial history of the United States. He said, if you want to understand America, particularly in the 20th century, the best guy to understand is Walt Disney because of what it was that he was telling in terms of the story of America. And when you think about it, Disneyland with Frontierland, right. with Main Street, is about a kind of nostalgia for, a, for, a, for an America that we may never have actually had. Right, it's a myth. It's a myth. And okay. so what would Lincoln have thought about the time we're living in? Interestingly, when you look at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, a big aspect of the debate is originalism this notion that we think is, is recent, which is what did the founders actually mean when they wrote the Constitution? And does what they mean really define what the Constitution says we can or can't do, right? That basically an originalist, Clarence Thomas, the late Justice Scalia, they believe that any rights or responsibilities that are in the Constitution are frozen in time in essence. Well, they pick and choose those those moments when they want to be originalists and when they don't. Hmm. Uh, two things I've noticed about Kogan. Not afraid to interrupt. <laughs> and I'm right. And, and that he's right all the time. Yes. Yeah. I've talked right. to his beautiful wife, Brown, about that. Um, mm. The, oh boy, she, spit take, wow, ladies and gentlemen. That's our first, our first spit take. Our first spit take. Our first spit take on Jay Cody. Uh, I mean, the fact that a Jewish wife would ever consider her husband right is pretty oh. funny. So that's, By the there way, you go. We also, one of the notes from the ex-girlfriend, we got to go light on the Jewish stuff. All right. It gets a little. Okay. Uh. That, was, that was a Walt Disney's note, too. <laughs> oh, look at Nick. <laughs> look at Nick. I still haven't heard back from Ford on the sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea in the Lincoln-Douglas debate, yeah. What, what did the founders of the Constitution mean 80 years earlier when they talked about freedom, when they talked about states' rights, when they talked about the ability to nullify what the federal government does? All men being equal. Exactly. And so the reason why Disney was so great and why I think Lincoln was so great, I mean, think about it. Of all the Americans that he could have done a robotic presentation of, mm -hmm. the one that he chose to represent the United States in all totality was Lincoln. And I think he chose very well. Could have picked Washington, but he picked Lincoln. Yeah, I think it's easier to animate a grasshopper and a spider and somebody with long... I think it's just about how easy it was to animate. Yeah. Nick, could you Lincoln. see if there's any other podcast guests <laughs> we can... co-hosts, maybe? So... <laughs> But I, what, I, I, what I'm also getting, and you have been, and I think you're the one who, who referred to yourself as one of Hollywood's greatest thinkers. And I think that's true. And I think that's why the strike <laughs> went 148 sure. days. I, I predicted 120, so I was you wrong did. about You were very you close. Were, you were. But you're a very bright man, and you're a, you're a lifelong learner. I've known you for 30 years, and you're always reading something interesting, and you're always learning. And I think, where'd you go to college? I went to a place called University of... Uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. So there is a university here? Yes, there is. Okay. Mm. Yes. So y did you learn to learn there, or have you always no, been this way? No, I did not learn to learn. I did not. And <laughs> there's no school that brought me closer to learning. School was the thing that drove me away from learning. What brought me to learning was being curious and then finding better sources to learn by. I mean, one of the great things, most inspiring things to learn about Lincoln and, and, uh, and, and the Civil War was the documentary by Ken Burns, The Civil War. And you start watching that and you go like, oh my God, there's, it's a big deal and it's so much richer and amer more amazing than you ever knew. And look at all these personalities and people and look at the conflict and look how smart it was. It wasn't just a moment in time. Mm -hmm. It was a, a cataclysm of, uh, of, you know, politics and religion and racism and what the myth of America is and should be. This, it, it, was, it brought me in saying, okay, that's a narrative story. I'm a storyteller. Narrative story is going to be rich and exciting and I want to know more. 
So I have to say, Jay, you've given us the greatest quote of the show so far, which is the Civil War. It's a big deal. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and if you put that in Latin, that it, would actually be the head of yeah. 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 So, but the other thing that, that I find fascinating is Lincoln was also, like you, uh, unschooled, uh, but curious, right? The, the University of California, thanks you. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> if, my, if my brother is listening, I, I know it's a wonderful school, really. Right. It's very good. Um, so... When you decided to go into comedy, uh, why? Why are you doing that versus teaching at a community saw, yeah. college? It's in your blood. Well, it kind of. I mean, I I saw my dad. My dad's a TV comedy writer, and that looked like a horrible life. But show business looked super fun. Mm. So I said, oh, I'll do anything but what my dad does in show business. So I tried to be a comedian, and I tried to be an actor, and I tried to be many things, failed at all of them, and then eventually started writing things with a friend to try, and then they, oh, go write. We'll pay you to do that. And then I fell into writing. Okay, your father is a legend. Your father, uh, besides being He was also the alternate choice of Walt Disney to do that thing, the animatronic Arnie Kogan. But they decided to go with Abe Lincoln. (laughs) <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, not doing well today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he also worked for Mad Magazine. Yes, he did. Which is the coolest yeah. thing ever. And yeah. one of my, one of my, uh, this is maybe inside, but one of my prized possessions is your father did a send up of a show I did and autographed uh, for me, which was wow. very, nice. very nice. So. Mad One, Magazine. Well, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, do you mind that, if I talk so about inside. my podcast? Mad your own Magazine podcast. sent up sent up Felicity and sent up Star Wars, and they called it Star Bores. And they have me and JJ, and and I'm like, you can't do this. You're stealing from all the other movies. But it, the 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 illustration is so funny. And JJ tried to race and buy it, and I bought it before he yeah. did at the original. And the the yeah. artist. I mean, it's one of those things. Yeah. Honestly, Mad Magazine. I grew up. Did you were you reading it? Constantly, when it was you... around the house. My dad, they get, they sent us like twelve of them every month, and I got to ruin two of them. And then uh, he kept others in a pristine vault. He did, yeah. yeah and oh, then wow. for for sale later on, when he got older, he said oh, these will be worth something. Then he tried to sell them; they're worth nothing. But uh, it's uh, by I the do... way, if you're listening for the first time, yes. welcome to QVC. Exactly, we're selling a whole <laughs> you know, set of Jay Cogan. When you're asking the guest yeah. a question, he tries to answer it, and then you shit on him. <laughs> shit on maybe him every maybe, time, your, maybe every your friend time. should talk about. That okay. aspect of your podcasting. Host. I just find that fascinating. I find that that you know, because um, that shaped my hu- spy versus spy. Like shaped my yes. sense of humor growing up. And Mad Magazine. I just is that way you attack everybody. You yes. See? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's, now the irony of that is Lincoln himself was a collector of humor books, and he claimed that he never told an original joke. He always said he was a retailer. Which sounds like reteller yep. yeah. of jokes. But he had a large collection of books, including books that were inspired by his presidency that he didn't endorse and didn't get any money for, uh, Old Abe's Jokes. And there is the one um, book of the 60,000 on Lincoln, all of his jokes. There are a number of them. Oh, there are? There is a, there's a large number of them. And what's interesting is. You know, I've, I've done a lot of uh, reading into them. And the first step in the book, How to Be Lincoln, is to laugh. And I talk about the value of laughter. But I also talk about the fact that none of Lincoln's jokes are funny. <laughs> is that true? Well, some are racist. Wow. And would get them canceled. Right. He unfortunately had a uh, gift for mimicry uh, and dialect. I'll say no more, except in the book, among the lessons I try to impart is, if any joke involves uh, mimicry and dialect, don't tell it. (laughs) Unless you're as good as Abe Lincoln. (laughs) Right, right, right. right. Speaking of his voice, the actor who played the voice of of Lincoln in in The Ride That You Love sounds nothing like Lincoln. From what we know about Abe Lincoln, with the high-pitched, weird-ass voice. Oh yeah, how this do, is where interesting. Do we, where do we hear, like if somebody wants to hear what Lincoln sounded sounds sounded like, I, I, I don't know. There's so only descriptions. Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, this fellow Spielberg yeah, put yeah. a lot of time and effort in collecting all the contemporary accounts of his voice and going to uh, experts on dialect, and particularly 19th century dialect, 
and they fashioned what they believe, and I guess what historians believe is probably the closest we're ever going to get. And my problem with the Lincoln book, which I discuss here, mm -hmm. is uh, I didn't know if he sounded like Ned Flanders from The <laughs> Simpsons, but that's how Daniel Day-Lewis played it. Right. Yeah. It's a high pitch kind of, I will have the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah. And <clears throat> I read... That people the, people he, said he had a high pitched voice, right. and 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 like former Dodger Willie Crawford, <laughs> for a large man, he had a very kind of a squeaky, a squeaky sound. weird ass but voice. Does it, bring up that picture again, Nick. Nick, does that look like a man who has a high pitch? He was huh? so tall. He right. was, that's yeah, it was odd. weird. And then when he uh, all his famous, imagine all his famous speeches being spoken by a high pitched squeaky voice. Right, and it <clears throat> it kind of fits with every other aspect of him yeah. because because. The incongruity of Lincoln in every aspect, the, the fact that he looked like a monkey or an ape or a baboon, according to people who, who didn't like him, and yet most people found him in an odd way attractive. Everybody who knew him and talked about him talked about the fact that the photos, and he was the most photographed American up to that point that had ever been, and he was a willing participant and an eager participant in creating this visual library of his image, even as he made fun of his own sure. looks, right? People say the photos never did him justice because there was something in his movement. Right, but he was a genius. And let's face it, getting your photo out to America right. is a good idea. Yes, it is. And so he was partly what I thought you were gonna say, but you haven't said it, but maybe you will. The duck comes down if you do say it, is, <laughs> He was a he was if he is the greatest American, he's the greatest American because he was fortunate enough to be born at a time when new technologies were coming, and he was a real uh, innovator. He was an early adapter. He saw the possibility of photographs, and was the first politician to make use of it. He's the only person we've ever had be who was elected president. Truly, the only one who didn't have a campaign manager. He did it all himself. Mm -hmm. So is that not what I said earlier, that he made use of photographs to, for I his political that. advantage? One of the things you didn't <laughs> Let's roll say, back. Yeah, I don't know. This is what I'm saying, all right. is I was hoping you were going to say that he made use of photographs, and you didn't, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we have the tape. And Nick, okay. Nick, you were Nick, going to, and I think I here's cut the you thing, off. Nick can clean it up. Fa God, fascinating, too, is... No matter what, if he was living in today's technology, he wouldn't be president, and he couldn't be president with a high squeaky voice and the weird, you know, his weird quirks and and less attractive than potentially. We, we just elected a man who looks like the Syracuse mascot, and you're saying <laughs> Abe Lincoln couldn't be elected president? <laughs> yes, yes. Interesting. Uh, I think there's there's boom in that guy's voice. The, if you're talking about the orange man. So, uh, so your experience as a second generation Hollywood legend, who is the launching pad for who is going to be the third generation, your, your, your talented, very talented songwriting son. son. Right. Who also, just, just dropped. Just dropped a single yep. this weekend. Yeah. Yep. Right. Please yeah. Uh, listen to uh, I, I, Charlie Cogan. That's K-O-G-E-N. Yeah. And the new song is called um, uh, party, Life of the Party. Parentheses of one. That's his. Uh, you right. know, Lincoln. His genius at branding and advertising <coughs> was to know the title of his son's. He does music, remember, and he yes. knew it like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. My son's so prolific. I can't keep up with all yeah. the work. Yeah. That he, he if uh, if I could uh, if I could maybe the GoFundMe psychiatric help for Charlie <laughs> Sophie. I'd like to give five bucks. Can we so talk, I want, can, can talk? I can I finish one thing? No. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say I want to just talk about because you're talking about your son. Talk about Lincoln as a father. Hmm. Because uh, there's a potential guest that is unbelievably hilarious. And, and he was texting me all these things. He's like, Lincoln was the greatest American to ever live, the worst father to ever live. He had four boys. One of his boys was at all three assassinations, which is weird, that, that he was there at his dad's. He was there at, uh, I don't know, two others. And that's Lincoln's fault? No, no, no. But he was saying. Who and is then, this yeah. schmuck? And I don't want him as a guest. The other three died. Yes. Yeah. So, but, but well, to be fair, there were a lot of people dying in the 1860s. You know, like, that, that was not a great time to be alive. Madison that's wasn't true. great. You know, life expectancy was like 28. One died as a baby. The others died. To, like, it was like it's. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm asking well, you. What's fascinating? How, was he yes. a good father? Well, that was an, that was a much discussed and debated issue. 
there were people who felt that Lincoln was a bad father at the time because he was too, I guess you would say, woke. He was too progressive. He had been beaten as a child. His father, Thomas, was, uh, was not a drinker or a violent man, but he was of that school of thought that was 19th century America that spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, Lincoln wouldn't hit the kids and didn't hit the kids. And Lincoln believed in spending quality time with the kids playing with them. And as I talked about, I think, last time, you know, his, his, his youngest son, Tad, if he were alive today, would be diagnosed as on the spectrum mm-hmm. with autism. And he had learning disabilities and he had, uh, he had a, a cleft palate and he had, you know, real challenges that Lincoln always showed almost saintly like patience with. Did Lincoln openly talk about that? Back People, then? not only did he talk about uh, his sons in, in a positive, loving way, uh, and the Lincoln movie does a good job about the conflict with Robert, his oldest son, who wanted to go fight in the right. Civil War, and Lincoln, fearful that Robert's death would destroy Mary Todd, kept him out of the war. Right. But and that made Mary Todd perfect. Yes. She was great otherwise. She was, yeah. She was, uh, yeah. And he was great otherwise. He was also depression, right? Doesn't he rack with depression his whole life? Yeah. The greatness of Lincoln, as his law partner William Herndon said, the greatness of Lincoln was how flawed he was. I mean, it, what's interesting is when you say, and it's such a good point, it, it's got, I mean, I know it's a good point because I keep thinking about it. Could Lincoln be elected today? Well, here would be the rap. He uh, had significant episodes of depression Mm -hmm. where his friends were worried enough about him that they took his razors out of his bedroom. And I've quoted the Delmore Schwartz poem, Lincoln, Manic Depressive Hero, about the fact that he really, I suppose, would be seen as as unstable. He's not the guy necessarily you'd pick to be the person to lead the country through its greatest crisis. But he was the perfect guy to be there. And that says, that gives me hope. Mm-hmm. Like my my flaws can be overcome in a moment that's needed to do what I need to do. It's it's the it's the Zelensky uh, miracle, right? Yeah. The idea that and that should give us all hope at this table. The idea that a uh, mildly funny Jewish television comedian can become the president of his country and lead it with with Churchillian. Gravitas. Where it's going to go? Who did, who did Lincoln uh, try to appeal to most back then, as far as getting people on his side or understanding, getting through some of the worst things that he had to deal with? And how did he do it? Was it was it with humor uh, at, at the top? I mean, I know you start with laughter because it's the first well, letter of Lincoln's name. But I, 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 t- I don't make fun. No, but, no. You know, I read think it's very the re- smart. get past page seven, <laughs> and you'll have more authority on this issue. Dense, but dense. I, That's all I'll say. I, very I, well written. I talk about the fact that that Lincoln used humor mm-hmm. to attract a crowd, mm-hmm. and what he found was that the people who came to scoff at this absurd-looking person, and who came to scoff at his self-deprecating jokes stuck around and became his constituents, his supporters. Who did he appeal to is a great question. He was a lawyer. And what do we do as lawyers? We appeal to everybody Hmm. because the jury panel is going to include everybody. A friend of mine is doing jury service right now in Los Angeles. And he said, he's a fairly cynical guy, but he said uh, they're standing in the hallway and the jury panel the 58 people from which they're going to choose 12 is standing in the hallway. There's a fellow from Wisconsin. And he said, looking at that panel, every single type of person you could imagine, and some people you couldn't even imagine. And he said, I realized this is why I came to Los Angeles. If I was still in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, everybody would look the same. And the beauty of the rich tapestry mosaic that is America is something that Lincoln deeply embraced. Even before the immigration wave that would change America, Lincoln had a kind of a preternatural understanding that what made us great was how different we are. Mm -hmm. And so I I think it's fair to say Lincoln tried to appeal to everybody. And correct me if I'm wrong, he met people where they were. 
So he would talk to a farmer about farmer things, and he would talk to a banker about banker things, and he would talk to an intellectual about intellectual things. He was able to sort of, you know, give everybody what they needed and reflect who they were back at them. Was he a traveler? Did he did he travel the country? Or so let, he... let me let me get to that because yeah. I do want to talk about that. But th- th- there's a quote from a great piece by the historian um, Benjamin P. Thomas who said the keenness of Lincoln's own sense of humor was due in large degree to his intimate knowledge of men. And he was a traveler. We talked a little bit about his trips to New Orleans as a, as a flatboat pilot, right. uh, a thousand miles each way, where he met in New Orleans with every type of merchant in order to sell the stuff that he took down there. And what you said is exactly what his bodyguard said, which is whether he was speaking to the lowest or the highest, uh, each one of them would have felt that they were talking to an equal. Which makes a great politician. Right. Now, you, which is a good thing. Yeah. You know, the, the, I'm not the, being derogatory. The, right. No, no. Right. Right. That's just, uh, Barack Obama did the same thing. That's right. I'm, I'm reading, listening to right now, A Promised Land, and it's it's fascinating. The beginning, at the beginnings, he keeps trying to go back to these stories he heard about how, how troubled the country was at the very beginning when he was running. And, uh, and Axe, you know, David Axelrod would say, okay, you know, these, you've got to avoid the answer. The, the questions that they're giving you just sort of don't answer. Answer them to make them think you're answering the question, but get your points across. And he's like, that's bullshit. I don't want to do that. I want to answer the questions. These are really serious questions that people have about their own personal lives. And it came from all of the people that he met and the troubles that the country was going through. Well, which gets us back to could Lincoln be elected today? So a little bit I talk about comparing two Illinois, Illinois politicians, Obama and Lincoln, and their similarities and their differences. And... Lincoln did his best to appeal to everyone and showed respect to everyone. He was unique in his ability to uh, be empathetic and even to his enemies. They asked him what did he want to have happen to Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee when the war was over. And Lincoln said, I hope they escape. Yeah. He, he was a He's practical enough smart. politician yeah. to know that the worst thing that could happen would be to try these two guys for treason and have them be acquitted. Right. Or martyred. Or martyred. Yeah. One of the reasons I wrote the book is I hear good, intelligent people talk about how divided we are. Yeah. And as if we didn't have a civil war. Right. <laughs> and I hear people talk about how one side doesn't respect the Constitution, but the other side does. And I think about the fact that we have a Constitution because we tried a different form of government, the Articles of uh, Federation, and we had armed rebellion because nobody wanted to pay taxes. So there's an American cussedness, I don't know what else to call it, that, that we are a nation that was founded by people who don't like authority. I don't, don't like taxes. That's for sure. That's right. <laughs> they don't like taxes. Right. They mm-hmm. don't. They, and yeah. and uh, and that is deeply baked into the American pie. Right. As and, opposed to all the other cultures, cultures that love authority and love taxes. <laughs> right. uh, you go to if you go yeah, to France. Right. They love taxes and they love authority. So I think history is if you can only study one subject, the subject you should study because we are products of history. The history of the United States, our legal system, the geography, our language, everything that we are is the result of the historic fact of our breaking away from a monarchy. But human beings have a desire. I talk about the desire to believe in a truth provided by someone else. That is, we we have a willingness to put ourselves under an authoritative kind of leadership because it's comforting. May I, I half agree with you. I think we oh, I got we, a half there. We I need know. we need belief. We need values. We need belief. We need to believe in something for we sure. Need fa- we need to have faith in something. I don't know that we need a leader or somebody else necessarily to have. There's lots of independent people who have come up with their own idea of what they believe in. But yeah, I mean, I, I I'm so I, I totally agree that we seek some core belief to operate our lives on. But and and a large portion of, of humanity f- 
seems to feel comfortable and acts in a way that acquiesces to the strong man on the on the uh, on the white horse. Right. That's well, right. when you're sold a bill of goods that um, winning at all costs is the most important thing. I'm doing a, a documentary right now. Pete Rose. Pete asked my son when we were shooting. He said, "Why do you play baseball?" And my son was playing college ball. He says, "Why do you play? Why do you play baseball?" And he says, um, and he looked at Pete and he said, "To win." And Pete said, "Yes." I am tired of this trophy and that trophy. That's not what we're about. You either win or you lose. That's it. You don't win. You don't. It's not about teammates. It's not about friendship. It's not about learning the game. It's not about uh, you know being in better health. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about winning at all costs. And and I'm like, wow, this is a guy who's so driven. You take that and you apply it to politics. You apply it to today. It's at all costs. I don't care if I'm wrong. I don't care if I'm going to hurt other people because. I can't lose. Mm. I've been sold that bill of goods. I have to win, mm. and that and, and 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 whoever it is, it's that represents so that, a winner. The most the most important part of what you just said, I think, is the use of the word "I," and that's the difference between Lincoln and everybody else, right? L- Lincoln understood in, in a unique way how to balance his individual political ambitions and desires to win. And something we've lost, which is civic virtue. The idea that there's something as or more important than just me winning. There's, there's society, there's right. the civil society. A democracy gives power to the people because the people in all of their diversity are supposed to be equal. Right. And well, we've lost that. Mm-hmm. Right, because one of the beliefs that are no longer being instilled in people is the belief in this experiment that Lincoln tried so hard to save, that it's worthy, that this experiment is worthy. Mm -hmm. And that's not being taught, that's not being embraced, at least by a a huge chunk of of Americans. Uh, You know, you're so right, and the proof is all around us, but the most obvious proof to me recently has been, I have the sense that that many politicians and many people in the United States are more afraid of a federal government in existence than of no federal government at all. Right. And that to me is the product of something that Lincoln was desperately committed to, which is teaching democracy to people. If you don't teach civics, if you don't teach democracy to people, we're not born with an understanding of it. In fact, I think we're born with the opposite. I think left to our natural instincts, it's either a Hobbesian war of all against all where there's no society and we're all libertarian at heart, or there's a willingness to put somebody powerful who's going to tell us what to do so we don't have to think about it. Mm-hmm. Democracy is a very hard-won competence. For sure. And we haven't given people the tools to operate the machinery. Right, but, but even more, there's other stuff pushing back against the idea, like, you know, for the last, I don't know, 80, 60 to 80 years, there's been people saying, you know, the, the government's the problem. And the, the, just, that's, that your government is the problem. They're incompetent. They're terrible. Your taxes are being wasted. That message has been hammered and hammered and hammered. And that's all that some people see. They don't see, and these are people that, generally speaking, aren't living in the big cities to see what government's really doing and to see that they're it requires infrastructure and requires right. so Good all right luck we, without it. We're, we're running out of time which kills me because uh i want to so two things i want you to come back i thought this episode was gonna be a lot funnier i did too <laughs> i blame kogan sorry uh because they're not gonna blame me i'm a drama guy <laughs> exactly uh jay kogan is uh, what we would say in latin is a good and schimmel he's a good soul and before i became a writer in hollywood uh, he was one of the writers in Hollywood who I got to meet through my beloved wife. And I, he's a mensch. Oh, a- the best. And I didn't realize how rare that was until I went into show business. Mm. But Because the law is full of menches. No, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it, it goes, let me tell you, it goes Peace Corps. Right, okay. Uh, anyway, we love you. America loves you. Yes, I and love you. And America needs to know more about you. So this they podcast yeah. airs it's, when? Uh, it's it's dropping in the middle of October. It's called Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan. And we've got 
much guess much better than me for you you that, i mean I'm, my I'm, god i'm already Great jealous guess. celebrities I'm already Great jealous. Guess. i've got uh big celebrities big big uh comedians uh you know i'm trying for don rio is there a uh, is there a punky brewster episode uh there's no punky brewster episode okay. but it's uh it's uh, about it's it's taking ideas and th- issues that uh i have and we're exploring it and then so I'm, I'm pitching that i do philosophy fridays on twitter yeah so if you want to get a hold of me philosophy Follow Jay I ask Hogan. a question yeah. to people on Twitter, and we have a civil discussion on Twitter. It's oh, pretty great. Yeah. It's really yeah. great. Dianu. Yeah. Already. Yeah. I mean, for God's sake. I'm yeah. not his agent. Uh, our next Thank guest you is for pounding coming. at the door. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good right. sign. Okay. Okay. Love you, Jake buddy. Okay. The How to Be Abe Lincoln podcast is based on the book How to Be Abe Lincoln, Seven Steps to Leading a Legendary Life by Jonathan Shapiro. Out now everywhere. The podcast is produced and hosted by Jonathan Shapiro and Greg Grunberg. Music, editing, and producing by Nick Marzok. This has been another Motel Podcasts production.